Hello, I'm Pam Hoffman, Everyday Spacer. I'm Jeff Miller, 2049 Outfitters. At Everyday Spacer, we show regular folks how to personally and directly participate in space exploration, science, and astronomy. We're on Friday nights at 9 p.m. Pacific Time, 12 at midnight Eastern Time, and 6 a.m. on Saturday in Germany. We're broadcasting live from Thousand Oaks, California. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, before we jump, jump in with our guest here, we absolutely want to say thank you to Louisa. She sent the rocket guy that lives in the rocket. <laughs> and uh, we got a nice postcard from her. She was on our show just a few weeks ago, and we had a great time. She related uh, crocheting and knitting to logic gates. That was really cool. And uh, on September 18th, just so you all know, we are celebrating a one year anniversary. Jeff and I have been doing this show for almost a year now. I did a bunch of things before that. Yeah, it was really cool. And uh, we're going to, well, we'll talk about that later. Yep. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Tonight's guest is Dr. Adam Dipert, aka the Space Juggler. We'll be back in 6.8 seconds. Okay, help us welcome Dr. Adam Dykert, Dypert. Okay, I'll, I'll learn how to talk one of these <laughs> days, aka the space juggler. He has a PhD in experimental nuclear physics, which, um, he, so you do um, helium-3 experiments to explain the lack of antimatter in the universe, if I... To sum it up. Yeah, to <laughs> sum it up, yes, I know, I know it hurts you to hear that kind of explanation <laughs> for it. But, um, Tonight, we'll mostly talk about space juggling. And I have to admit, my first thought when Pam mentioned space juggling <laughs> was the old vaudeville type skit where someone's juggling and they don't come back down. And I was thinking, space juggling could be a very short endeavor. <laughs> but then, then I saw your website, and that explained a lot. And it's really quite interesting. So can't can't wait to get into it. And, you know, we can certainly ask Dr. Dippert to come Dippert. back. Dippert, sorry, yes, to come back sometime and tell us about the experiments. If you're okay with doing that, that'd be wonderful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'd love to come back and, and share more about that part of my research. Awesome. So please tell our audience a little bit about space juggling. Yeah, so I... Um, um, in addition to being a physicist, I have been a professional circus performer uh, for my whole adult life. I, uh, you know, took that traditional route of graduating from high school and then uh, getting the heck out of town and running off to join the circus. So <laughs> I spent uh, age 19 to 23 on the road. Um, and circus has just been kind of the foundation of my understanding of physics because after I did my years of circus was when I started in uh, college and I got into multivariable calculus and realized that the things that we were talking about in that class were exactly what I was spending all of my days doing. You know, I'm working with objects, moving in three dimensions through space, things rolling on each other, balancing, et cetera. And so, um, you know, fast forward a bunch of years, I continued doing uh, circus and I continued uh, doing physics, and I went on my first parabolic flight, and before that flight, I started wondering, like, okay, what do I need to know to make the most of this? Because the truth is, most people don't really think about it before they go on these flights, and yeah. I read news, or I read articles from, you know, NASA and other researchers describing people's experiences, and describing their experiences, for example, when they're trying to jump from one side of the plane to the other, and they always talked about spinning, that like no matter how they pushed, they always ended up spinning a little bit. Mm. And so one of my kind of logics when I'm learning a new uh, skill with circus stuff is that if a behavior starts happening kind of naturally, then just lean all the way into it until you understand it, you know? Oh, and cool. So I said, I'm going to just do, I'm going to understand spinning. I'm going to really understand this. So I made a human uh, model of the human body, uh, 
mapped out all of the centers of masses of each of the limbs, all the joints, et cetera. So then I could calculate where the center of mass of the whole body was going to be. And then also what axes the body could spin around stably, because you can't spin around stably, uh, any axis you can't spin around stably. And so through that uh, research, I realized that when you're in a standing position, you can spin around your belly like a cartwheel. Mm -hmm. And I never see anybody doing that right? Like, why, do, why don't people do this? And that really got me thinking about it. Like, okay, here's the thing people aren't working on. And as I pondered, I realized my head would trace out a circle if I was making that shape. So from there, I, I you know, thought, okay, in space, balls will travel in straight lines. So what if while I'm spinning in a circle, I throw balls down to myself so that when I get around to the other side of the circle, I can catch them. Mm. And that's kind of where it started. Uh, so Sounds like juggling to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I keep wondering if this is actually juggling or not. Um, and if you, you want to get a little taste of it, you could um, go ahead and play that first video. Okay. Um, and really, you know, the, the thing that's confusing is like, what do you do when all you can work with are straight lines? Because, you know, on Earth, we're used to working with parabolas, where we have the ball coming up and coming back down. But with a straight line, it seems kind of too simple to be interesting. So as I started studying the movement, and I started, um, you know, trying to understand it better, uh, I realized that without gravity always forcing the ball to come down, it kind of changed where my juggling was happening, rather than happening all around my waist, you know, now I can catch it up next to my head and, um, and then I can go even lower on my waist in every single direction. It moves the same speed. Uh, and so that really became, uh, something that kind of transformed my physical experience, uh, in the practice that I, I wasn't expecting. I wasn't expecting it to open up my whole body in this way. Hmm, and so, so you, you, uh, you probably juggle, you know, like on in regular 1G circumstance. I mean, you knew juggling before you started doing this, I take it, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I've, I've done my 10,000 hours. Um, okay. I, I calculated, I kept track of my, my practice for two and a half years one time. And wow. I feel pretty confident that on earth, I've thrown more than 10 million times. Oh, uh, wow. And that's, you know, <laughs> what juggling takes, you know. Um, okay. And so in this video, what you're seeing is an apparatus that I built so that I could practice um, because I want, if, if I was going to do this on a parabolic flight, I wanted to have a way to practice, you know, so I could make the most of my parabolic flight time. And so right now what you're seeing is me hanging facing down and I have a clear surface in front of me and then I'm rolling the balls on that clear surface. And I got this idea after I was talking with Story Musgrave. Uh, he was an astronaut from uh, 1967 until the early 2000s, and uh, we were chatting. And he said, "You know, if 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 you uh, you know move something on a two-dimensional surface, it moves just like it would move in space." And hmm. I hadn't really thought about that before. Um, and so we're gonna we're gonna back up and just watch some of these sequences one more time. Um, okay. And so yeah, as as we were chatting. Um, I, I didn't have this concept in mind yet, but after the conversation, uh, this whole thing just really fell into place super quickly for me. Um, so, oh, so yeah, what, what you're going to see, and we're, the reason I wanted to play it one more time is because I kind of made a transformation that I, I didn't describe. Um, when I started practicing, this is what I was doing. I mm -hmm. uh, put the camera below me, faced it up so that I could see what I was doing, and then I spun around in a circle and... Um, practice throwing the balls. And what I realized is that even though the balls are traveling in straight lines, when you're looking at them here, mm -hmm. uh, when I'm spinning, I don't see straight lines. I see curves. And so, so when I had the video, I wondered, what if I spin the camera at the same rate that I'm spinning? Could you see what I'm seeing? Mm -hmm. And when I started doing that, I realized, yes, you could. And wow, these curves are real. And if you're a science buff, 
then you would know that these curves uh, are generated by the Coriolis and centrifugal forces and that these are fictitious forces. And I think this is a really excellent example of why those are fictitious forces because these balls are still actually traveling in straight lines. Right. Okay. And we had a question. Um, yeah, let's go back to full screen maybe for- yeah. Hi, Cliff. Hi, David. Yep. Yeah, Welcome and uh, thanks for joining us. And Let's go back to uh, yep, there. Okay. Um, so Cliff says hi. Um, and David um, <laughs> is asking about your parabolic flight, but we're getting there, right? You, I you, suspect you're getting there, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because, yeah. So we'll, we'll, we'll answer that in due course, David. So that was, um, so. Yeah, so I, I guess just to say something about that, I've been on three parabolic flights um, and done 57 parabolas and really go in with a, a pretty strict schedule of what I'm going to be practicing. And usually, um, yeah, there, there's so many layers <laughs> to a parabolic flight uh, that, uh, you know, everything you've heard is true and um, it is incredibly challenging and you really, I, I think the thing that um, gets missed in the conversations about it, because there's, there's not a lot of um, skilled movement artists speaking about it. And that's something that I want to help facilitate is getting more um, skilled movement artists into weightlessness is that um, this experience, which we all know is related to our proprioception, right? And it's all related to our inner ear and your vestibular system getting messed up, right? Because you're used to always experiencing gravity through your inner ear and you're using that as a cue for what's going on with your body and what's going on in the environment. And when you take that away, then you discover like, oh, actually me always touching something was related to that, right? Your butt's always on the seat, your feet are always on the ground, your hands are whatever. If you're in water, you can always put, you know, push on the water in order to cause locomotion. And once okay. all of that stuff is taken away, your perception and your movement are severely altered. And so that just messes up your entire, you know, <laughs> mapping of the world around you. And you gotta figure out some technique to go inward reestablish connection with your body. Um, Kitsu Dubois, she's a French choreographer and dancer who I really look up to, and she's been studying zero-G dance since 1990. Oh. Um, she says that once in your first moments of weightlessness, you become just eyes because you lose all of that other proprioceptive stuff. And what you need to do is figure out how to become a person who's inhabiting an entire body again. Wow. And that's the process that I go through when I go into a parabolic flight is I always spend the first two parabolas just relaxing, just tuning into my body, recalculating my dimension and my relationship to the environment uh, through a new set of parameters that uh, are not the ones that we use on Earth. Wow, that's fascinating. It would be wonderful to, to talk with her maybe as a guest on the show. And uh, David had another thought here yeah well yeah how close the zero g harness how close is it to being in actual zero g yeah so it's actually a lot different than being in zero g um because you're rotating you can feel gravity right so you can feel the gravity vector and when you move your head if you've been in a rotating room like one of the big ones that spin around real quick um kind of the most disorienting thing you can do is to move your head in this direction because then yeah. your semicircular canals really get super messed up. Right. And so I can experience that in the harness. What is that, Jeff? <laughs> I said it's fun. Yeah, it's, it yeah. is really fun. Um, so I experience that in the harness, that um, that when I move my head, I can feel you know the weird forces going on. Um, in weightlessness, that really just isn't something that you feel. And there's this great video on YouTube of two astronauts, and one of them uh, is spinning the other one, and he's kind of in a tucked position. And he gets him spinning really, really fast. And the guy in the tucked position says he never starts feeling the spinning in his inner ear. Um, and so that, yeah, there, uh, if you don't, well, just to say your um, vestibular system is, is made up of a, two kind of pretty important components. One's called the autolith, and that's what gives you your um, linear acceleration and then your semicircular canals that gives you your rotational acceleration. 
And so these things are coupled. So when you don't have access to a gravitational vector, then oh. your other sensors kind of get all messed up. Um, but and I'm really excited to see what will happen in the future when more dancers and more circus artists are in weightlessness and they have the ability um, both to, you know, really tune into their bodies, but also to give us feedback because it's so dominated by people who are scientists and, you know, though they haven't spent 20 years or 50 years focusing on just their physical experience and how to communicate that to other people. Right. Okay. So uh, what else does David have to say? Oh, is your study more, more entertainment than science or a melding of two entities with definitive benefits for the space program, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah. So all of my, um, question. <laughs> circus research is, uh, is very centered in, um, science-based topics, uh, because that's how I see the world. And, uh, you can't take, you know, once you see the world through the eyes of physics, then you're just stuck there. You have to keep seeing it that way. Well, and so, as a nuclear um, physicist, I would imagine. So, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and so there is this one component that the, um, you know, the body spins around in this cartwheel kind of motion. And so I've had the opportunity to speak with some astronauts about this stuff. And, uh, and I've been told more than once that they haven't actually um, thought about the, what we call the moment of inertia of the body in the same way that they think about it with objects or something. Um, yeah. So like your phone, right? Um, if you're an engineer, you might think it has moments of inertia, which are kind of these uh, axes that they can spin around stably. Moment of inertia is actually a pretty complicated um, math topic. So I don't want to get into it too deeply. But, um, but yeah, I found that through investigating this, I think I'm shedding light on some of these more subtle aspects of how movement actually works in weightlessness. But then also um, in these videos, and let's go ahead and play the third video. Sure. Um, what you will see is that um, in the rotating frame, uh, the balls, of course, are moving in these uh, curves. And as I, and so here in the left uh, image, you see uh, the non-rotating frame. And in the right image, you see the rotating frame. Um, and so these curves that we're finding in the rotating frame are the same curves that we're going to observe when people are in uh, rotating spaceships, except instead of throwing down, they'll be throwing up. <laughs> Wait, <what? spaceship>. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so you can see on the right now, rather than kind of making that big loop, it's now making a loop that comes back and crosses over itself. You see that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so just like we're used to parabolas, they're going to have to get used to all of these types of curves. Uh, and then the, the last pattern here, if you look at it on the left, you'll see that I'm throwing the balls parallel to each other. And then on the right, you can see how different each of the ball trajectories look because of the Coriolis and centrifugal forces. And you can see that the one that goes close to my face kind of goes down and makes a little cusp. And the one that goes far away from my face makes this big loop. And I really want you to focus on that one near my face because that's crazy, <laughs> right? That ball is moving down, stopping, changing directions, and then going back the other way. And it is literally just traveling in a straight line in the non-rotating frame. And I have found only wow. two other scientists who have investigated this in relationship to rotating space habitat lifestyles. Uh, and so I'm really excited that I kind of stumbled on this aspect of the work. And um, it's definitely inspiring me for my next layer of, of work in this regard. Um, and I will be publishing a paper um, specifically about uh, those curves because there's a lot of a neat, there's a lot of neat details about them. Well, yeah, one of my <laughs> thoughts on it is depending on the radius of the circle that you're, you're going in, you could have different behavior at different heights relative your, to your body unless it, you're in a really large ring. Yeah. That is completely accurate. Yeah, and um, the it's really interesting because that led me to formulating kind of different sets of equations, you know, for uh, what I thought would be useful. So I now have like one set of equation which gives you a start point and a velocity, and then you find out what happens to the ball relative to that. Another set says, if I'm in a rotating environment 
uh, and I want it to start over here and I want it to end over here and I have a certain amount of time between the two, what are all the possible paths that it can go between those? Um, and so I really think that what I found is kind of what we would think of as like standard forms of equations, you know, like if you're talking about lines or something in algebra, you have the point slope form and you have the slope intercept form and stuff like that. And so, um, so yeah, I think that even though it's playful and my focus is entertainment, um, you know, a mind, a mind who perceives the world in the way that mine does can't help, but, um, try to try to get every last detail that I can. <laughs> All right, let's see. David says, what are the orientation problems being in zero G? In other words, when we do become more involved in space travel and more people do it, what uh, does one have any trouble remaining upright? Uh, orb spiders have trouble leaving the webs in the ISS. Oh, interesting, I didn't know oh, that. Oh, and, and here's a follow-up to his. Do, when you're in zero G, does upright actually mean anything to you? <laughs> yeah, so that, you know, that's a really excellent philosophical uh, question and matters a lot. Uh, what does up and down mean? And I think that it's really healthy for us to get out of that mindset. Um, kind of one of the things that this branch of investigation has, has shown me is how deeply up and downness are integrated into our language and into our metaphorical structures. Mm -hmm. And it's really important because we use metaphor to do reasoning about the world. And when gravity is embedded in those metaphorical structures that you're using to think about the world, then they're embedded in the way that you're reasoning about things. Uh, an example would be like hierarchies, right? That concept would not have any meaning without a gravitational vector. So, you know, there's somebody on the top who's making decisions that everybody on the bottom has to deal with. Um, you're so, always trying to climb the corporate ladder. Um, you can think about how prices are raising, right? Like uh, we relate size of number to up and downness, which really has nothing to do with up or down. Uh, huh. More, more is up, right? Um, okay. And again, has nothing actually to do with up or downness. It's just based on our experiences, which makes sense, right? If you have a glass and it has more water in it, the water level in the glass is higher. So of course you would conflate these two topics. Um, but then you can think like, does doesn't work that way in microgravity though. It doesn't <laughs> work that way. It makes the world like sphere if it's yeah. if it's not contained really in sphere. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe some alterations to language because our all, mm. language developed where the two are the same. Yeah. I mean, because our, you know, our language and a lot of our, tra our training, early learning is they're, they're identical, which yeah. doesn't. And there's a lot of physics history involved in decoupling things from, <laughs> from what, you know, what early training has told us are the same thing. Yeah. Which is one of the reasons I love physics and circus so much is because you have to unlearn so many things in order to be successful at them, right? And that, I think unlearning is a skill that's just as important as learning, you know? When can you identify a structure that isn't working and And, and almost as out? hard, almost as hard, if not harder. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because it's um, so ingrained in you already. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and just to say one more thing about the up and downness, you know, there's kind of these these words that get stuck in our languages that are um, what we call dead metaphors, meaning they don't really have meaning anymore. But that's such a common aspect of our language that it stays. Um, and yep. one of the things that I've noted is that we don't actually have um, uh, words for things that are above our head, other than above, right? So even when you're in weightlessness, if two people were floating in different orientations, I, I think for a long time, we're still going to refer to things that are, you know, along the vector of their spine from their butt to their head <laughs> as above, even if people are raised in weightlessness and that, you know, up and down or above and below don't have meaning in other contexts. Well, the thing is, is that I guess we're going to either have to you, re redefine the word. Oh yeah. <laughs> thanks David. But, um, either redefine the word, um, basically double duty the word to basically mean 
a different thing in space, but you know, have the same general meaning. But we're going to have to come up with different words. Oh, we will absolutely. And, I'm sure. <laughs> and quite frankly, I think just reinventing the same word is probably going to be the the path of least resistance for a lot of people. Well, I, I have a Duolingo event every Saturday, and I talk to folks from all over the world who are trying to improve their English, and they start off, for me, super impressive. I mean, they really know English. I just I just watch them see so get more confident at it, because we're, we're casual. We stay really casual. But I will share with them different terms, and I've learned a lot of stuff, too. Like, I mean, the term blackball, there really was a thing where they would vote and it would be anonymous, but they use these little balls. And if it was black, that's how they got, they kicked somebody out of their membership, for example. And, but the, but the term has stuck with it, even though most of us have no idea what that's about, mm -hmm. but they'll still be here. And I've shared, I don't know, I've probably shared about 25 of these with, right. with this group now. And it's like every single one is like, well, we still use that but it's, it's transformed somewhat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Those types of, are they idioms or something like that? Is that kind of what you're yeah. saying? Well, and you know, there's another, it's phrasal verbs is another thing that, but yeah, I think idioms is the one for this one. Oh, Hey, Splash Autumn. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, sun's coronal heating, a mystery. What does the thermodynamics explain about it? Oh boy. That's a whole nother topic. Yeah. Should we get a, should we get a guest for you <laughs> to talk about that? Do you know anything about this? Because I don't know enough to answer uh, this question I either <laughs> i i i am not the person for that question okay. all right splash adam let's start looking for somebody Thank to help you, you out <laughs> <laughs> all right and we've got a couple more here david. david just an observation adam you do the ball juggling okay but how do you okay thanks <laughs> thanks david um but how do you go with the upside down <laughs> 10 pins behind you on the cupboard <laughs> Oh. <laughs> um, but we call background. those clubs, first of all, clubs. Pins. Um, and yeah, I do okay with clubs. Yeah. yeah. Well, okay. D David is us Australian, so he's probably talking about um, bowling. Oh. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, 10 pins. Like there's 10 pins in the Yeah, like, bowling. Yeah, bowling. bowling. Yeah. Right, right. Gotcha. So let's see. I think we have a couple more here. Um, uh, Splash Autumn. Thank you. What? Okay. Cosmic voids. <laughs> Why are there cosmic voids? What causes cosmic voids? Does it tell what does it tell us about dark energy? <laughs> we uh, got we got to find a physicist for that. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's kind of stay out, tuned. Outside of your nuclear <laughs> physics, I, I think, but maybe I don't know. I mean, unless you have some insights on that. <laughs> that's that's not one that I'm I'm ready to talk about now either. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, Thank you, though, for asking. And you know what? That gives us a lot of material to work with. We will start looking for people to help you. Yeah. Oh, so it's all about convection. Okay, so uh, David <laughs> David answered um, the sun's coronal heating. It's about convection. Yeah, David has been in, involved with astronomy for a very long time. Should mm -hmm. we tell him it's like 50 plus years, something like that? So, yeah, David's wow. very knowledgeable. And it's a delight to hear from all of you all the time. Thank you yeah. so much. So we did have another video here. Um, did you want to play that? Or do you want to talk to us about your experiments? Or Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I'll sh show you this video and um, okay. explain a little bit two. about it. Because this is really, um, I have, here, I'm going to pause it. So let's, we'll just start with this circle. Um, okay. I, so I formulated my first version of the equations uh, last year on a vacation. Uh, my girlfriend, of course, did not perceive this as vacation activity, but they all put up with it. Um, <laughs> and uh, as I as I was putting it together, I, I was doing it in in comp using complex algebra, like complex numbers and things. And I found this relationship to an Archimedean spiral equation. Um, mm -hmm. And so for the last year, I've trying to trying to been like, you know, these things are like Archimedean spirals, but they're not exactly, but like one of them is an Archimedean spiral. And it just really was, it's been driving me crazy. Like, I'm not going to come up with new math. <laughs> Give me a break. Uh, but I knew there was a mathematical structure that would describe what is happening here. And I just hadn't found it. And I hadn't talked to anybody else who had found it. Yeah. And so um, I was talking to this fella, um, uh, Ted Hall, who's at University of Michigan, and he's a space architect. And he was curious about when you're in a rotating spaceship, 
you know, there's artificial gravity, but how is that different than the gravity that we experience on the surface of a planet? And okay. he had observed that um, there are some trajectory or that there, yeah, there are some trajectories that make what we call uh, involutes. And so I'm gonna show you what, how you make an involute. Uh, if you start with a circle and then you put a line next to it and then you uh, roll the line around the circle without slipping, uh, that's kind of our first step. The next step is to follow a point on the line. So we're gonna follow this point and remember the line's gonna roll without slipping. And what you end up getting is this very particular curve. And Hi. that's called an involute. Now, if we take that point from far away and then kind of bring it in so we kind of get a reflection of it, this is what it looks like. And that's what you saw me juggling when I was uh, juggling and making that cusp kind of maneuver, right? Where it was coming down oh. and stopping and changing directions. Yeah, the one now, the Archimedean spiral can be made if you um, take a an offset from that line. It goes to the middle of the circle and the... Uh, length of the offset is equal to the radius of the circle. And so this actually makes an Archimedean spiral. Hmm. Hmm. And so again, we can see that from a distance and we're going to see it kind of roll in there. And so most of the patterns that you see me juggling are going to look a little bit more like this and they're going to be some version of that type of curve. Uh, now, if we keep going a little bit deeper, what I discovered was that if you actually follow points that are offset by different distances, then you get all of these different curves. And that entire collection of curves fits into a mathematical structure that we call pedal curves. Wow, that's and beautiful. So, I, yeah, I think so too. And um, so after you know 15 months of having the equations in front of me and talking to everybody that I could and nobody really having a good answer for what... Um, what the curves are that people are going to be dealing with in rotating spaceships. Uh, I feel really happy to have my answer. They're all pedal curves. And, uh, you know, I'm the only one who sleeps better at night knowing this, but, uh, <laughs> but I do. I might too. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta understand it first. I, I haven't studied it like you have. That is fascinating and so beautiful too. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Okay, so a little bit more from David. Thanks so much for uh, for helping us out here, David. Yeah, um, would you say understanding and dealing with, with zero G would be the biggest problem we face in long-term space exploration? Um, I think that's gonna be a big deal. You know, people get acclimated to it after a couple of days or a month or something. I don't know how much you've um, heard astronauts talk about this experience. Oh, no, please. Yeah, we really appreciate uh, the questions. It's fun. Uh, you're making this different than all of my other, uh, you know, just talks, David. <laughs> so thank fabulous. You. Yeah, yeah, just totally. Um, the, okay, you're asking about weightlessness. Yeah, okay. Um, so astronauts obviously are very concerned about not getting hurt, right? That's like a really big deal to get hurt on the space station. And you got lots of work to do and there's no rest and you know you just really got to keep going so um they say for the first couple of days they are kind of bumping around and they're kind of like knocking their elbows on things and then uh three or four days into it then they start to settle down a little bit and uh kind of like get their space legs but then after about three to five weeks is when it actually clicks for them and then they can kind of move a lot more freely uh, so that, that, that I think is worth noting. Um, I also have had the opportunity to hang out with the people at the Ashton Grable Spatial Orientation Laboratory at Brandeis University, where they study, um, people in alternative, uh, gravitational environments so that they can understand how your motor responses are and how your perceptual responses are to different environments. And so they have a 22 foot rotating room. It can go up to 35 RPM. And when it's spinning, um, they had people reach forward to grab something. And what they found is that usually when they start, they reach forward and their hand goes off to the side, right? Again, because of the Coriolis force, just like what we were seeing in my videos. And after about two uh, minutes or so, 
they reacclimate so that they can reach forward and grab the thing. Then when the rotating stops, they ask them to reach forward again, and now they act, they end up reaching in the opposite direction because they've made a muscular change. Um, and so, you know, that's still in a gravitational environment. So it's only kind of changing one parameter that you now have Coriolis and centrifugal forces in addition to the gravitational force to deal with. But we acclimate pretty quickly to that. Um, and so I think that people are going to acclimate in weightlessness pretty uh, efficiently. And, um, and, you know, the question is, uh, are we going to be satisfied with seeing kind of pedestrian movement, you know, just what everybody comes up with uh, when, you know, you learn to walk and you learn to run and you learn to skip and you learn to do all of these things? Or do we want like Olympic leather level movement or, you know, professional movement artist level movement and weightlessness? And, you know, frankly, at this point, we can't even imagine. Uh, but I am doing my best to imagine and to figure out how to visualize this. Uh, and I say we have them all. <laughs> Sounds yeah, wonderful. I yeah, I would rather live around a, or I'd l rather live in a solar system that has really incredible uh, circus in space, personally. Absolutely. Yeah. Sounds great. Yeah, yeah, did you have something else? Um, yeah, do you think it would be better to have a, a larger volume to play around in? I mean, because the space station is pretty cramped. Mm -hmm. Oh, man. If I could be on Dear Moon and get in the Starship, I would be all about it. That, uh, yeah, I definitely think more space is going to be interesting. Um, I have, and actually here, do you, I mean, y'all probably want to see a little zero G movement, right? Um, sure. Let what me pop heck? a video in here for you. Um, David, ask questions. That's cool. No problem. Yeah, you don't, you don't have to be anymore. quiet. <laughs> it's a delight <laughs> to have you here. Okay. Yeah, it's really fun because even figuring out how, so this is me and Tony Craig. Um, oh. She was working on her MFA in dance um, when we went on this flight and we had trained with Kitsu prior and then also we're training in pools and stuff like that. And it was really amazing to be uh, in the flight with another person who had, had trained with me because we could interact as you're seeing. And like in this movement, we were kind of imagining like holding a steering wheel and then controlling each other's um, angular momentum by, you know, turning the steering wheel. I'm going to repeat that section of the video one more time. Um, and it's really incredible to experience Newton's laws so profoundly, right? That when I push on her, she pushes on me and we're constantly influencing each other's position and angular momentum. And this moment, this was kind of one of my favorite uh, moments of really subtle movement around each other. Um, oh, it looks like dancing. Thank you. That's so cool. Oh. So we're going um, to learn how to dance with zero G someday. You know, we will. I mean. Yeah, yeah. I, I really am I'm motivated about this. Um, cool. And what's so, what, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. So, oh, Okay. Yeah, it was just, yeah, he's talking about 2001, the huge space station. Oh, because well, they had it in, uh, it's rotating as well. Do you think it would be noticeable in such a, a much grander <laughs> oh, yeah. if, situation? Yeah, if you had a, such a large loop. I think, I don't know, you might be able to tell it. I think the average person wouldn't be able to tell, you know, the height difference if you're standing on the inside of a really large um, ring. Yeah, wow. you're talking in order. Okay, so this is something that um, this fella, Ted Hall, that I mentioned, who's at University of Michigan, who had, had been researching this stuff before, um, his specific question was, how would it be different, right, if you were in wow. one of these large rotating space stations? Mm -hmm. And so what he thought was, if you hold a ball and you drop it, you know, on Earth, it just goes straight to the ground. Right. But on the space station... Uh, it already has momentum in the direction that you're turning, right? If we're turning in that direction, then the ball already has momentum in that direction. So when you let go, it actually is already traveling in that direction. And it, it starts falling and it falls in one of those involute curves when you just let go of it. So then the question is, how far to the side does that involute curve end up causing it to fall? And in his calculations for a spaceship 
that is um, uh, with one G, right, one Earth gravity, then you're talking about a, sp a station that has like a thousand meter radius. Wow. And things smaller than that, you're always going to see it curving. And even at a thousand meters, you're going to see the thing curving a bit. And so it really, um, yeah, it really does have a big influence on um, on the physical experiences that you uh, that you have and and what you observe in the environment. Um, so, hang on, I just wanted to check my numbers real quick. Uh, so. So yeah, it looks like at, okay, yeah, at a thousand meter radius, it would have a deflection of 10 centimeters from center. Hmm. So, so you're, what height are you talking about um, dropping it from there? From head height. Oh, from head height. Six okay. feet or five feet or something like that. Yeah. Sorry, so, I'm mixing my units to me. That's fine. <laughs> that's fine. Um, so five centimeters, about like, ten or 10 centimeters. That's ten about centimeters, like that. Yeah. yeah, exactly. yeah. So, so not much. So not much to have to really get used to. Mm -hmm. but, um, Enough I'll, that you don't want to drop your coffee, you know? <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> and, and, unless you're anti-spinward of it. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, it could be safer. Maybe not mm -hmm. for the next guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I there's a lot we'll of other. Go ahead, Pam. Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. No, I think we'll adapt, but yeah, please, please continue. Yeah, there's a lot of other really interesting phenomenon about being in rotating spaceships, and I am very enthusiastic about it now that I've been kind of <laughs> jumping in. One more, David. Yes. <laughs> okay. Bernard von Braun's um, huge rotating wheel had people walking on the inside wall. To them, it was the floor, and yeah. rotation gave us normal G. Yet, um, it seems too simple. Why wasn't it incorporated into the ISS design? <laughs> well, I don't know if it's hard to do. I think I think they were supposed to have something that rotated, not you know a huge like well, live-in station yeah. for one G, but well, something for experiments. But conservation it was very hard. of of momentum and rotational energy means that you'd have to constantly be de-spinning the part that you don't want to spin because just friction would start dragging the rest of the station around with it and the more mo and they're always trying to damp out motion in the station yep everything's moving everything's vibrating any Gee motor <laughs> yeah any fan any motor is causing movement adding purposeful movement to the thing <laughs> It's just one more thing that you have to deal yeah. with. And they just thought it was too expensive to mess with. Mm. Although it would probably help long-term, you know, use up there so that people don't lose too much bone mass. But it was yeah. just too um, too expensive, I think. Uh, did we miss one from Cliff? It looked like there was one before. Oh. The, yeah, that one. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they want to put like 10 miles wide. Oh, I think they're talking, he's talking about a 10 mile wide ring. Yeah, okay, something like that. I don't think you'd notice too much effect. <laughs> We're going to find out, right? <laughs> Please, let's find out. <laughs> All right, yeah. well, you know, it is really late for Dr. Dybert here. And uh, I know he wants to tell us about the videos coming in October and November. And please... Uh, share with that. And also, uh, one other thing, just tell us where can uh, viewers learn more. Oh, we should have done this before, too. Uh, more about you. I have uh, your website here. So that's one good place to go, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, hop over to thespacejuggler.com and you can see more videos. I really showed you just a very few of the videos um, that we've made. And I'm really excited because we have a number of more, we have, yeah, I'm sorry, my words are uh, messing up now. Uh, we have many more videos that uh, haven't been shared publicly publicly yet. Um, okay. I have a short film um, called Dreaming of Space Struggling, which is uh, kind of the emotional expression of the work. And then we have a behind the scenes film 
kind of describes how we built it and everything. And so starting in mid-October, I'm going to be releasing a film every week or every other week um, to just kind of like describe what it is that I found and hopefully entertain you a little bit, hopefully, you know, stimulate a little curiosity and a little thought. Um, I really deeply believe that if science and mathematics topics were presented in a more palatable way, more people would understand that they could be good at math. And so the whole, you know, structure and the whole guiding star for what I've been, what I work on is that I really think that more people can uh, find that mathematics is a relevant topic in their life and that they could be more skilled at it. And so, um, so that's kind of what the part of what the video series is building up to is, it's not just um, look at space juggling, be entertained by it, but it's like, what does this mean? You know, how, how is it that you can understand just by looking at geometry, just by looking at pictures, just by curves? Uh, I will do a math, um, a math, math video where I'll, I'll describe that in more detail. Um, wow. And so really, I, um, I really just want to explore this topic and tell the topics related to it. And so if you follow me on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter um, or sign up for my newsletter, um, then I'll keep you updated as we're um, making things public. Yeah. And it's all the same everywhere, The Space Juggler? The Space Juggler. I, I really, you know, got good advice early. Make sure everything's exactly the same. And yeah. 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 Cool. You know, one of the things that you could do is when we're done here, just make a quick comment in this that way anyone who's here or who sees the video later will be easy it'll be easy for them to find you on facebook yeah okay. but um cool. yeah david had a question are you in any way involved in Ooh. jugglers art space inc in queensland australia the stairwell project hmm. no i haven't heard of this oh there you go time to get involved <laughs> okay well that's in comment that's in comments so if you're at you know if that piques your interest you, you can find it there to and we um, got a couple more while we're yeah and david yeah, are you commenting from face are they commenting from facebook or from they're commenting yeah from these are facebook right now yeah yeah um live long and prosper yeah yeah so yeah likewise it, thank yeah. you cool. it's been wonderful having all of you here since yeah, we yep <laughs> yeah cliff's been kind of quiet but um but yeah. okay <laughs> So. All right, so um, I'm going to go ahead and add this uh, the Space Juggler one more time so people can see it. And I wanted to, we this part of our show, we kind of talk about what's happening. Some uh, it was you know, We call it some stellar events this week, and that's the uh, September 10th through September the 17th. On the 13th, we have the first quarter moon, and this moon is high in the sky as the sun sets in the west, and it looks like a half moon. September the 14th, Neptune is at opposition. This is the best time to photograph Neptune. Uh, also, Mercury is at greatest eastern elongation. So you want to look for it at its highest point in the west around sunset. On the 16th, Saturn and the moon are in conjunction. You'll catch them eastish early evening, and both are easily seen naked eye. And then we're right, uh, also Pluto and the moon are in conjunction. Uh, this uh, Pluto is easily seen, but no, the moon so, sorry, the moon, <laughs> the moon is easy to see. Pluto requires optical aid. On September 17th, Jupiter and the moon are in conjunction, and this is just a single day later, so they're you know the moon keeps moving farther east, and all of them will be together, and they will all be easily seen. And then we're back to our Friday night show on the 17th. Yep, and so uh, find us on the Everyday Spacer Facebook page and the Everyday Spacer YouTube channel. If you or someone you know has done something interesting involving space exploration, science, or astronomy, we'd love to share our live. Join us again next Friday, September 17th, where I'll be talking about Radio Galaxy Zoo, our next citizen science project. And we are celebrating one year of these shows, so... So watch for something special to mark the occasion. He cooked up something right before it, so we can't really tell you about it yet. Because we haven't actually figured it out. We don't know yet. You want to go ahead? Okay. So we look forward to future guests. Um, currently scheduled, John Keppel or Keppel, and I'll again ask him about his name before we do the show, author of The Art Flame, September 24th, and Mike Simmons, 
one of the founders of Astronomers Without Borders on October 1st. And we're talking to a few more people who have not yet been scheduled. Greg Allison, Tim Pickens, Sherry J, Chelsea Gould, and Don Dowdy. And we had a couple more questions come in. You oh. want to catch them quick before the outro? Okay. Um, Thank you. And, and, and for <laughs> once, he isn't a what? Canadian. Oh, because our, our last few guests have been Canadian. Have they? Okay. <laughs> I don't know. We're all from Earth, dude. <laughs> Oh, a picture of them. Okay. Oh, okay. Oh, I think I saw that. Yeah. Oh, okay. That. Uh -huh. Oh. Uh -huh. We'll have to look for that, Cliff. Yeah. All right. Sounds Thanks cool. so much. Thank you, Dr. Diaper. And we definitely want to have you back to talk about your experiment if you are willing and able. And uh, with that, we'll see you next week, folks. Mm -hmm. Have a great one. See ya. Thank you. Thank you.